Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. It is one of the great puzzles of American politics. How voters could make history by putting Barack Obama in the White House twice and then elect Donald Trump as his successor. How much responsibility should Team Obama take for the course American politics has taken since they left center stage? Well, my guest today is Valerie Jarrett, close friend and advisor to Barack and Michelle Obama from the early days in Chicago all the way through the White House years. How will historians view... Valerie Jarrett, welcome to Hard Talk. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. If I may, I want to begin by taking you right back to 1991. You then met, you interviewed a young Michelle Robinson for a job. You were a senior lawyer. She wanted a job. A few weeks or months later, you met her fiancé, Barack Obama. What did you see in that couple that attracted you to them? And what do you think they saw in you? Well, I had just been promoted from the law department to deputy chief of staff for Mayor Daley, and I was staffing up my office, and someone sent me a resume, and across the top it said, brilliant young lawyer, has no interest in being at a big law firm, would like to explore public service. And I had abandoned a big law firm as well six years earlier, and I was impressed with her resume. And so in walks this tall, confident young woman, shook my hand, looked me dead in the eye, saw my resume, never mentioned a word that was on it. She told me her story. And of course, we all now know it's a quintessential American story about growing up on the south side of Chicago, working class family, instilled in both she and her brother the sense of, uh, to those who much is given, much is expected. And although they hadn't gone to college, they supported she um, and her brother both going on to college. And, and further, she went on, obviously, to law school. So you were mighty impressed by Blown Michelle away. from the get-go. Offered her a job on the spot. I didn't have any authority, I might add, to offer them <laughs> that job, but I did it anyway. But the weirdest thing then happened, something that I still struggle to truly understand. She, when you offered her the job, she didn't just say, yes, please, I'll take it. She said, we've discussed it, my fiancé and I, and he has a few problems with the mayor, and he's not quite sure it's the right thing for me. So I'm not going to take it unless you agree to come and have dinner with me and my fiancé, Barack Obama, and then I'll make a decision. She put it a little softer than that, but that was basically it, which is that he's uncomfortable, and I want to make sure that we do this as a team. And so... I was intrigued. I wanted her very much. I'd heard of him when he was a community organizer in Chicago, and obviously his being president of the Harvard Law Review was something that had impressed me. And I was happy to do it. And people who think it's odd, I say to them this. I say there wasn't a single decision he made about his political career without her right there at the table as well. And so it was more an indication of the partnership that they had and their approach to make big life decisions together. That, that is a fascinating thing to say, but uh, it, it strikes me that there's almost a, a rider one could add to that, which is I'm not sure there's a single big decision he took going all the way through the White House years that didn't involve your assent and agreement. Well, I will say that the three of us bonded that night uh, in 1991, nearly 30 years ago now, and have been... Uh, very close personal friends. I look at them as the younger siblings I never had. See, that, that to some raises a very interesting question about potential conflict of interest, because you are the closest of close friends. You know the kids extraordinarily well. They know your daughter extraordinarily well. You holidayed with them all the way through the White House years, and yet you're also a very senior professional advisor. It's the opposite of a conflict of interest. It's a twofer. You have both somebody who knows you well, knows your core values, is only there to support you, as well as someone who brings substance to the table. Yeah, but Rahm Emanuel, Obama's first chief of staff, he clearly didn't think it was right. He was suspicious. He felt that there were channels open to you, direct to the president, that he didn't have, and that, in a sense, you could bypass the hierarchy, the White House machine. And, frankly, he, he wanted you out. Well, he, was, he had reservations about my coming on board, and I think what we all realized after we'd worked together for a while is, is that I was a part of the team. I was an integral part of the team, and that it wouldn't have been right for the process that President Obama set forth to circumvent, the, circumvent it and kind of go rogue, if you will. But you didn't go through the chief of staff. You went direct to the president. The I mean, three it, senior advisors all reported directly to the president. Right. All three of us See, did, but we were me. still a team. And I think that's the point you're missing. Well, I... I, I, I 
I wasn't there, but I'm interested in the reporting of some people who, who were sort of on the scene at the time. Daniel Clademan, for example, who wrote a, a book about the Obama presidency. He said that you were pretty much tantamount to a shadow chief of staff. Did you feel like a shadow chief of staff? I don't, even, I don't staff? even know what that term means. No, I saw myself, as did the other senior advisors, all who reported directly mm. to the president, as a part of his team. We met before we would go in and talk to him. We tried to reach consensus with one another. We tried to make sure that we had um, cast a broad net so that we gave him informed opinions. And then we went in there together. And if we disagreed, we told him, Valerie thinks this, so-and-so thinks that. And then President Obama would debate the issue and make a decision. And what I think was extraordinary about his leadership style is that he really listened to whomever he thought had the best ideas. Mm. And it could be the most junior person in the room. I want to go through a few of the issues that you in the White House had to deal with. And, and one that is such a strong theme through the memoir you have written is, is your take on race in America today. You, you were raised first of all, outside of the United States, in Iran. And you've always said that that gave you a particular uh, sort of context and perspective on race in America, because you were a young black girl who didn't actually face segregation and prejudice in the first years of your life. And interestingly, Obama spent a lot of his early years outside of the United States, too. Do you think you and he shared a perspective on racial division in the United States? I think we, we had the benefit of seeing the United States from the outside in environments that were not riddled with the discrimination that my parents experienced, for example, before they left the United States. They, they um, ended up in Iran because my father couldn't find a job comparable to what his white counterparts were receiving when he left the military uh, in the United States at a large academic teaching institution. That's what he wanted to do, his research. And so he landed a job heading the Department of Pathology and starting a brand new hospital in Shiraz, Iran. And I lived there until I was five. And then I actually moved here to the UK for a year and then to the United States. And so my very early years, in a sense, my parents took me over the color line at the same time, for example, that Ruby Bridges was integrating her school in Louisiana surrounded by armed guards, I'm going to an American school in Shiraz with young kids from all over the world. I was, in a sense, thinking in a different way that maybe Obama and you, with your perspective from outside the U.S. and the fact you hadn't personally experienced in your young life so much outright discrimination, maybe that was one reason why Obama always wanted to avoid being defined by policies that were perhaps to some people in the United States going to be seen as the politics of, of black anger or resentment or grievance. You know, he was always very careful to say, I'm a president who happens to be black rather than the black first black president. And some black people in the United States have felt that he let them down. He didn't confront the systemic racism that there is in the United States today. Well, first of all, President Obama to this day is extraordinarily popular in the black community. Extraordinary. His approval ratings are 90, 99 percent in the black community. Um, were there some people who thought that he should do more? Of course. You could go down probably every possible way in which people wish we could have done more. We wish we could have done more. But I think what President Obama did do is he tried to talk about race in a way where people could hear him, where it was a teaching moment. So, for example, after the murders in Charleston, when Reverend Pinckney and eight other parishioners were murdered uh, by self-identified white supremacists, he said, look, it's not enough just to take down the Confederate flag. What are we doing to improve our schools? What are we doing to strengthen the relationship between police and communities of color? He always tried to, to, to discuss it in a way where people could hear him and see themselves in the other person. And Why I do think you think, then, some very important sort of opinion formers, thought leaders in the black community have, in retrospect, been, been very negative about well, Obama's impact so on... So who are you talking well, about? Well, I'll give you a few quotes. You, you tell me what you think of them. Alicia Garza, for example, co-creator of... Black, black Lives Matter, exactly. yes. Exactly. She says this, too often, Obama has used occasions like, for example, the fallout from the killing in Ferguson, Missouri, which saw riots on the streets. He's used these occasions not to push for greater accountability within law enforcement, but to push a narrative that black people should behave more responsibly. 
Well, I would disagree with her, and the facts bear it out. In Ferguson, the Department of Justice under President Obama did an investigation. They found a pattern and practice of discriminatory behavior required the city to enter into a consent decree to terminate those practices. Police there were simply giving people tickets uh, as a way of generating revenue and disproportionately affecting the African-American community. So the facts there actually don't bear out that premise. One more thought. Frederick Harris, learned professor, director of the Center on African-American Politics and Society, Columbia University. This is where his conclusion is. Why should black constituents bear the burden of Obama's risk aversion? when it comes to these difficult issues of race. I don't have any idea what he would have had him do you differently. You never felt that Obama was risk averse? Not, a, not at all. He gave in the middle of his presidential first campaign one of the most profound, rawly human speeches about race I've ever heard anybody give against the advice of some people who said stay away from that. But you remember why he made in... that speech? Yes, he made that speech because his own pastor back in Chicago, Jeremiah Wright, had been exposed on video as saying some very negative things about the United States and its treatment of black people, which clearly Barack Obama worried about in terms of the impact on his campaign. And so he so thought... So that might explain some risk aversion. Well, no, no. What he thought he needed to do was to explain to the American people his relationship with the pastor, give them some perspective on the black church, which maybe they didn't have, and talk quite honestly about race. And I think, for example, in the aftermath of the shooting of Trayvon Martin, President Obama said profoundly, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon. He was trying to communicate to the broader public how it feels. Why is it that in our country, and he said this actually in the briefing mm. room, that a young black man can't walk down the street in his own neighborhood I remember. and worry about being at risk. And but out of that grew My Brother's Keeper, which is designed but, to help the trajectory of young Jared, black But Ms. Jarrett, if I may say so, and I do remember that passion and those words very clearly, Young men like Trayvon Martin are still being gunned down by police forces across America yes, today. They are. Yeah, they and are. I just wonder whether you, and in your talking with President Obama since he left office, whether you have thought about the reasons why, to be blunt, you failed to change that I think, dynamic. I think it would be unrealistic to think that one president is going to change in eight years something that's been a part of our society for so long. What he did do was to create a task force that looked at the relationship between police and communities of color, and he gave a blueprint to them of what they could do to improve that bond of trust, because both police and those who they serve and protect both deserve to go home safely. Unrealistic, you say. I guess that raises the issue of legacy and of what, you know, eight years of the Obama administration actually changed, fundamentally changed for good in the United States of America. What would you point to as a, a true lasting achievement? Well, so, for example, we cut the unemployment rate in half, including people of color. The unemployment rate was cut in half. 20 million people have health care today, many who didn't have it before. No one can be discriminated against for a pre-existing condition. Osama bin Laden is no longer walking around the earth. We didn't have a single terrorist attack on our watch. We brought home 150,000 troops. We entered into a climate accord with 200 countries, and although the United States has pulled out, well, the remaining countries and many of our Governors and mayors and business leaders have stayed in that deal, uh, and the list goes on. We've well, eliminated our dependence about, you know, you on can, foreign oil. You can talk oil. about the jobless figures. Of course, Donald Trump does just the same. You can talk about the killing of bin Laden. I guess one could describe it as important, but one could describe it as circumstantial. But the, the circumstantial well, that the person who was responsible for the horrid destruction in the United States and that we went after him and found him. Yeah, you went after him, just as other administrations before but yours we, had gone after him. But, yeah, but we for, found him yeah, exactly. and brought Obviously him it wasn't to Barack justice. Obama himself who did the intelligence it, work, but he was, he was the was guy who gave the watch. ultimate. Of course it was. But my point is this. In that list you gave me, the, the, the key, perhaps, was affordable health care. That was a, 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 a signature measure which Barack Obama personally put on, himself on the line for, and he got through the U.S. Congress. Keeping our economy from going into the worst depression since the Great Depression, which would have cascaded around the world. Well, many opponents of Obama would say, look, what, he inherited the, 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 the crash of 07, 08, and what did he really change about the banking system and about Wall Street? Substantially, did he really, oh, surely. really take on the Wall Street interest?
interest? Absolutely. There are rules of the road in place today under Dodd-Frank that will prevent banks from taking that kind of risk again with taxpayer money. You have not seen any of the kind of abuses that we saw under our watch when we first got there happen again, not to mention investing in the Recovery Act, which helped businesses and state and local government and reverse that trend bailing out the automobile industry that were two of our three automobile uh, manufacturers were in bankruptcy when President Obama took office. I guess the bottom line is that a lot of the things that Obama did were the result in the end of executive action because after 2010 you lost control of the House and you never got it back and you never had a Congress you could truly work with. That means that Donald Trump using similar executive actions and orders can undo and has undone that's true. much of that, what... That's, elections have consequences. And so when you say what's permanent, that's part of why I encourage people to vote because if you want to continue the trajectory that you're on, then you need to make sure that the people in office reflect the same values because yes, we reversed many of the executive orders that President Bush had put in place. That's what happens when you're elected president. But then when we come to legacy, that means that so much of what you did has to be blunt about it, been trashed. And I just wonder, I want to, if I may, I want to put you and, and the Obamas, the two of them, back on election night, 2016. I believe you were with them as the results came through. I was. Talk to me about your feelings, their feelings, when it became plain that Donald Trump was going to be in the White House. Well, it was profoundly disappointing, I think, to think that uh, a country that had elected Barack Obama twice would go in that direction. And it has been disappointing since that day. But as I said, it's also troubling that 43 percent of Americans didn't vote in the election. And after all, Hillary Clinton did win the majority of the vote. She lost in three sure, states well, by it's the, it's the rules less of the than electoral a couple. College. I mean, I, I just well, wonder whether but, you did you so, see it coming, or were you utterly blindsided, surprised? I, I did not see it coming. No, I did not see it coming. And I think. What uh, happened in the country created a wake-up call. And so began the day after the inauguration with the Women's March, the young folks from Parkland who um, organized March for Our Lives, the activism we've seen from the Me Too movement and Time's Up, uh, the record number of women and people of color who ran for office in the midterm elections, the fact that the Democrats in the United States took back the House of Representatives and, and put Nancy Pelosi back in as Speaker of the House, the fact that we have six women now running for president, unprecedented history work in our country to me shows great progress and in a sense some of it may have been a wake-up call but the activism is what gives me reason to be optimistic you called that result the 2016 election soul crushing and I just wonder given the strength of that feeling whether you and I guess I'm very interested in the Obamas too whether the Obamas are going to be very visible in your view in the run-up to 2020 in doing what they can to work with the Democratic candidates and the ultimate choice for the nomination, working as hard as they can uh, to get a Democrat back in the White well, House in I 2020. Am, I'm no longer a spokesperson for the Obamas. So you'll no, have to I invite them you, on, you, but you, I can tell you what I intend to do. With them still. Of course I do, but yeah. I don't speak on his behalf. I can tell you he's very concerned about the direction that our country's going. He was involved in the midterm elections. My expectation is he would do the same in the general election. I think all of us good Democrats need to get behind whoever is the nominee and ensure that that person wins the election, which is why I've counseled several of the candidates to not beat up so much on their opponents, that, that, that whoever emerges as a nominee goes into the general election in a weakened state. I think we have an embarrassment of riches in the field. I think we have some terrific candidates. And it's still very early, so we'll see what happens. Who do you like the look of most? Who right now seems to you to be the best? I'm not, not going to put my thumb on the scale, because at this time, when, when Barack Obama was running in 2007, he was down by 30 points. And Hillary Clinton was the inevitable candidate. But so I'm not going to put my thumb on the scale. I still want to see, we haven't even had our first debate. We have debates coming up uh, next week, I'm, or this week. I can't wait to see those first debates. <laughs> it just interests me, you, you, you obviously being very tactful, but you, you spent eight years working day in, day out with Joe Biden. Joe He's Biden's terrific. got uh, He'd well make a ahead great in the president. polls right now, He'd but you're not, you're not saying you think he would be the best candidate for the Democrats. I'm not saying anything one way or another because I think we have some really great candidates in the race. I've said quite publicly, I think that Vice President Biden was indispensable to President Obama. He'd make a terrific president. He'd be 70 do you think that's too old? I don't think that's too old. And there are six women, at least, I think, in six, the field. Six, yes. Yeah. And I think, and I know them all. They're terrific. Because 
It, again, in, in, in your memoir, you speak very openly and frankly about the, 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 the difficulties that face professional women who want to get to the top, whether it be in politics, whether it be in the law, and you've experienced of Business, both. all the way around, You yes. raised a, a young daughter while climbing that ladder and working crazy 14, 18-hour days. And then in 08, you found yourself in that rather strange position of working for a candidate who was obviously a rival to Hillary Clinton, who could have been the first female president had she won the nomination and then the election. Did, did you in any way feel conflicted about that? No, I didn't. As you know, I, we discussed early on, I've known the Obama since 1991. He's like a brother. I thought he would make a really outstanding president. And so, and that doesn't take anything away from her, who I strongly supported um, in the next election when she ran well in 2016. Mm -hmm. So, no, but my loyalty was clearly with Barack Obama. And I think he was an outstanding president, and I think history will reflect that. And you can't judge him so quickly. You have to wait a while. I think as, uh, as time evolves and we have greater distance, all the historians that I have said say it takes 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years before you really appreciate the legacy of a president. And what about the future of the Democratic Party? Leave aside the, the choice of, of one of these 20 to be the, the, the face going into the presidential election, but there is a battle for the soul of the party at every level. You've got the young, progressive, some call them the sort of the woke young <laughs> radicals, perhaps figureheaded by Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, and then you've got the centrist, the old guard, perhaps symbolized by Joe Biden. Now, there is a gulf between the two. Where does the party there's need actually, to be? There's actually not so much of a gulf. Well, first of all, I would say this about the Democratic Party, which I think is a strength, is that we've always had a big tent. All are welcome in our party. And there are always robust ideas. And there are plenty of people who you might want to label one way or another, but, but I think what they all have in common is they want every young child to grow up and have a chance to go to college and not be laden with so much debt when they finish that they spend their own life paying it off. They want people to be able to have health care, not go broke because you can't afford to take care of your sure. own health care. They want to retire with dignity. These but, are the core values of the blunt, Democratic Party. That's right. But to be blunt, both in terms of the message and the messenger, you've got to think very specifically, I guess, about how you win back the voters in states like Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and other m American sort of mainstream states where Donald Trump actually pulled it out of the bag. He won. You've got to win those people back. Well, Who, and most what of kind the, of Democratic Party do you need to do that? Most of the polling is showing, his very own polling is showing that he is, he's the candidate you mentioned, Joe Biden, is beating him in all of those states. And so I think that we, as I said, have an embarrassment of riches. And it is, and the challenge is not going to be motivating people to care. The question is, can we get them to turn out on Election Day? What I hear from the American people is, think about the issues that I talk about around my kitchen table. And give me confidence that you're going to go there and fight for me, that you're not going to put yourself first, that you're not going to be thinking about your legacy and winning the 24-hour news cycle. You're going to be thinking about me the, and my family. If I may say so, the more I hear you talk, and we have been in a moment, the more I hear you talk, I'm wondering whether you ultimately will run for electoral office well, yourself. Well, why would you think that? Because you've been around electoral politics for so long. <laughs> that should you be reason enough why. You clearly have a passion <laughs> to change America and continue the change in America. You know what I would say to you, Steve? I would say what President Obama said when he left left office, and I truly believe this, that the most important office is the office of citizen. And what I am interested in doing in this next chapter of my life is exciting people about participating in their communities, about voting, changing the culture around voting so, in a nonpartisan way. So if not you, what about Michelle Obama? No, she will not be running either, because she realizes you the same thing. You mean this time thing. around or ever? Uh, she will never run for office, in my opinion. And I think it's because she, too, believes that she can have a greater impact outside of the political system. Uh, she will devote her life to service. Uh, she's never been a politician. She's always been a public servant. And there's a difference between the two. Barack Obama managed to do both. Uh, neither she or I are interested in the political part of it. Help but, other people run for office, but not myself. Valerie Jarrett, <laughs> it has been a pleasure having you on Hard Talk. It's Thank you. It's a pleasure with you, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you.